This is Duke University. So I want to talk to you about Watson, but I want to kind of talk about AI more broadly. In fact, one way to think about this talk is to sort of reflect how my ideas and my appreciation, my understanding of, of AI has evolved over the years and sort of using Watson and my experience with, with Watson as a lens to sort of understand that. So, um, you know, just to take it back, you know, how do we think or define artificial intelligence? I have here the science and engineering of developing computer systems to perform tasks that if performed by a human would require intelligence, you know, whatever that is. And when I think about intelligence, I think about sort of, two, I sort of break it down into two ways, like knowing stuff and doing stuff. When I think about research in AI, um, you can think about systems that try to represent and reason about knowledge, try to understand and learn and predict things. But then there's a whole other part of AI, which is about doing, you know, build, you know, a classic example of this is like robotics, right? Walking, seeing, sensing, catching, flying. And when I started to get enamored with, uh, with AI, which is back when I was in high school, which is like, you know, the 70s or something, but, um, uh, you know, it, 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 the whole, you know, the whole ball of wax was sort of very, very fascinating to me. But in particular, was sort of the cognitive side, the understanding, uh, the thinking, the, the predicting. Um, but the robotics was kind of a very sexy side of it as well. But there was barely anything, you know, going on. There was just a pipe dream at the time, and it was very slow going, frankly. And I lived through the whole AI winter. How many people know what the AI winter was? And I lived through the whole AI winter. Kind of scary uh, time for someone who's really interested in in AI. Um, and it's just really kind of slowed down. But a lot has happened. It's taken a long time, but a lot has happened. And one of the things I'm sort of experimenting with this talk is, you know, referring to a few uh, YouTube videos. So here's, um, I don't, you know, you guys may be aware of this stuff, but did you see that? You could buy this, take it home and program it. It's got microphones, it's got vision system, it's got ability to walk and react. I can still do this. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's amazing, right? I mean, and so, so, you know, little by little, I mean, you know, uh, AI has been doing some really remarkable, remarkable things. And it just didn't happen all like that. It's taken years and years, but it's getting more and more, more and more interesting. And if you go to YouTube and just search on robotics, I mean, you can find ama amazing, uh, amazing results. Um, and our future is going to change for sure in ways that I only sort of dreamed about, you know, uh, 30 or so years ago. Uh, but you can actually see evolving, and I'm going to show. I'm going to show a few more, but um, um, we so can actually see with the light. you can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so another one. Is, so on, on the other side, it's like knowing, interpreting, understanding, reasoning, perceiving. It's interesting to think about what happened with Watson in this regard, and and I'm going to just warn you that. I think that um, people's interpretation of Watson, you can almost split the audience. It's also bipolar in the sense that, you know, half the audience thought, gee, what's the big deal? And sort of really underestimated what went on with Watson. And the other half the, of the audience kind of really sort of over, you know, I think overestimated. And what, one of the other goals of this talk is to kind of get you and this audience sort of appreciate what, what it was and what it wasn't and what it says about uh, or what, what it points to in terms of the future of things. So this is an actually quick sequence. And you can see Watson sort of thinking, right? It's going to pick a clue. So the answer's there. So now it's reasoning. What clue should I pick? It's making a choice. It's actually hunting for daily doubles. Because um, any good Jeopardy player knows you have to do that. So now it's, get, now it's betting. Right, so it's thinking about where it is in the game and it's computing what a reasonable bet is based on whether it's ahead or behind. So it's interpreting, it's figuring out what in the clue.
So like, like what it do there? So it um, so it was you know it so picked a clue at at bat based on where it was in the game. So it was reasoning. It was predicting what would be a really good bet in this case. It got a clue. It analyzed it. Tried to interpret it. It figured out what was important, was not important about the clue. It generated answers. But then when it generated answers, it evaluated its evidence and actually assigned the probability that its answer you know was good or bad. Actually at a threshold. But because that was a daily double, it had to answer. On a regular clue, that 32% chance was way below threshold. It would not have answered. So again, so there's a lot of you know reasoning and and uh, and understanding. And I use the word understanding very loosely. If you think about these two kinds of AI, one is very much kind of in the physical space, operating in the physical space. The other one is kind of in the cognitive space, which leads to um, what is me like when you're interpreting language. What does it mean to be in the cognitive space? It's sort of to kind of derive meaning from things. And what do we really mean by meaning? And I want to get into that a bit. Um, but one way to think about the contrast, to think about the chess problem and the you know, the human language problem. And when you step back and you look at chess, people thought, oh, this is a great AI program, uh, project because if I can get a computer to play chess, clearly that computer must be very intelligent because after all, only really intelligent people do well uh, at chess. But uh, when you take a step back, you know, what is chess? It's this finite, mathematically well-defined search space, right? Um, all the responses, like how you move a piece, are, are grounded in precise mathematical rules. It's a huge space, but it's still fine. It's, it's large, but it's still finite, and it's unambiguous. We know exactly what it means to, you know, what each piece is and what the moves are. There's no uncertainty in that sense involved. So if you could build a machine that can that can, you know, look in that search space and look far enough ahead about all possible moves and you know what would happen if you reacted one way or another way, you could start to build a very powerful chess um, playing computer. And once you kind of understand that, it's actually, and you step back and you think. It's not. It's remarkable that humans can play chess. It's not remarkable that computers can play chess. <laughs> or you think about what's going on there. But human language is very different, right? Human language is like, oh, gee, this is easy for me. Uh, for humans are language processing machines, right? Um, but you know, something really interesting is going on there because the words have no independent meanings. They're just symbols, right? Um, they're all just bits to the computer. And there's almost an infinite number of ways you could express. Um, meaning and ultimately the words are really only grounded in human experience and humans learn language and language is used to communicate that shared or common experience so you're still sitting here and I'm using words and I see a couple guys are nodding and you know that implies to me they understand me I really don't know if you understand me I really have no idea but you know I assume that you have enough of a common or shared experience that my words are landing in the right place and you're forming this understanding based on your nodding that's similar to mine and we think we understand each other um, so I'll tell you a story so um, humans learning language I have two young daughters and this is I guess my younger daughter at the time was about seven and what was a common experience in my household was you know would tell um, I would say to my girls you guys got to come down here this is really really interesting really really interesting and Okay, and then I'd be doing some experiment in the sink and try to get them excited about it. And I'd be doing something else. You guys got to come here. You got to see this really, really interesting. So after doing this many times, at one point, my seven-year-old daughter stopped at the top of the stairs and she said, Daddy, interesting things are boring. <laughs> and um, she essentially had learned the meaning of interesting and she was quite certain that it meant boring. Because that was the experience that she was associated with that, you know, with that word. So dealing with human knowledge requires sort of deciphering meaning, and it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, what it means. So here's an image, right? The image, you know, goes into the computer memory as a bunch of zeros and ones. But we could do all these different levels of interpretation with regard to the meaning. But the meaning is subjective, and we humans actually are the subject, right? So um, you can start interpreting this in terms of colors, you know, white, black, and red. Uh, you could do object recognition and say, well, there's a calculator with some dice on top. Uh, you could look at it and you could think, gee, calculating the odds. Actually, the label associated with this image in the repository I got, it was winning. So this is, what was, this is the meaning that was associated with this image, which is winning. Um, human use of tools is another you know, way to interpret you know, what's going on here. So you know, how do we decipher the meaning of an image? And that could be very, very, or, or language, or a word, or a phrase. And when we don't know what the meaning is, but we assign the meaning, we as humans assign the meaning, and it's not explicit in the structure itself. We think of that as, I think of that anyway, and the word we use for such a long time is unstructured, meaning the semantics were not explicit. There, you're not told what is intended. 
So we can think of meaning as kind of this probabilistic mapping from symbols to some shared experience, whether it's being between two humans or, or two computers. And I sort of this, did this other, I did this other slide to kind of help think about that. So the bat was flying toward us, right? So you're, you're mapping these words to some cognitive representation, some shared experience. So it could be like, you know, you know bat, flying, you know, flying towards you, uh, could be a bat flying toward your windshield because of your jilted lover, whatever it might be, but there could be things going on. So you don't really know how to map these words yet, right? And then you hear Billy ran as fast as he could. And you're thinking, oh, okay, well, it could be, you could, Billy could be running home, you know, because he was scared of, of a, a flying bat. It could be that, you know, he just hit a home run in a baseball game and he's running home, right? So you're trying to disambiguate this. There's some probability you're associating with, with each of these scenarios, and there may be more scenarios. He made it home safe. So you're still a little bit confused, right? Could have made it home to his house, away from the bat, could have landed at, you know, home base, and then finally he scored. And, you know, like you're pretty sure you're, you, you're, <laughs> you're pretty, there's more ambiguity there, but you're pretty sure that you've landed in the right, in the right spot. So you know, the more the richer and richer the context get, context gets, you know, you could, you know, the more and more information you have for triangulating this, you know, these words with regard to how they map to your experience. You say, okay, I really think I understand what's going on, and your nod gets stronger and stronger, you know, as that con context get richer and richer, and your probabilities kind of get better and better. Here's another interesting thing: your meanings could be, you know, meaning could be very subtle, especially you know, just small changes in words and phrases can change how people think about things. This is actually image searches on Google. I did safe at home. And here's, here were the top, uh, you know, whatever it is, the top um, you know, five images. I did home safe. Look at that. <laughs> Completely different um, interpretation. I did safe home. Completely different. So very, very subtle. And, and now you start to appreciate the challenge of what we had to deal with on the Jeopardy project, right? Just shift a couple of words around, and you've got a very different meaning of what's going on. Uh, and of course, the computer's not really, the computer's doing the searches, but the computer doesn't know what these words mean. Why can the computer map these words, these images? And it's because people, humans, where the meaning originates, label these images with these different fa phrase, uh, fa phrases, and with enough data, the machine learns how to associate the probabilities that this is the right interpretation. Right? The computer is not living in the world and doesn't do this. It's learning from the human association of these words. But you could see how, how subtle it is to distinguish between these things. So when we think about AI, what's the expectation for machine understanding? And you may or may not agree with this, but I think computers may be trained to analyze data and detect human meaning, but it's humans that are the source of the meaning uh, in, in language. Um, and, that, and, and that there's an insight there that kind of helps us appreciate what to expect, um, I think, from artificial intelligence. I think there's a, a, a tremendous power there, but we, I think we also have to understand sort of where the limits are. So another place where this, um, you know, this sort of insight struck me was in, the, in music. Uh, so there's a story about Tchaikovsky and his Sixth Symphony. And he was asked, you know, what, what, you know, what did that symphony mean to you? And tell me about composing it. And he says, the idea came to me for a, a new symphony, this time with a program or a theme. He meant the, the, this work will be entitled a program symphony number six. I have shed tears while composing it. I put my entire soul into this work. I love it as I have never loved before any of my musical off offerings and so forth and so on. So a tremendous amount of passion in this music and what it, what it, what it meant to him. When he, uh, the story goes that he went to perform the symphony for the first time, and he named it Symphony Number no. Six. He performed it, and the audience hated it. They jeered, "Boo! You know this is crap." Uh, and he just astounded. And he goes back and he thinks, "How could they have missed this? How could they have missed the significance of this music?" And he goes back and he renames it the Pathetique, the emotional symphony. And he goes to perform it again. He explains what it means, and they love it. Right, and that, so that was very significant to me. Um, here's another little clip. This is uh, Costas composing this, uh, um, uh, uh, conducting this Sixth Symphony. And I just, I just notice the emotion here, right?
So he's really get, he's really getting into it. And I think what's so what's interesting about this was I imagined, you know, could you get a computer to generate music and you can, and perhaps if you showed it enough examples of really good symphonies, it might even be able to compose a symphony like that. But then when the audience hates it, what does the computer tell you about it? Right, so basically what's happening here is the, the human being who did the composition is shaping, is changing, is leading by explaining you know, what this should mean to us as humans and we're, and, you know, we're sitting there and go, oh, I get it, right? And now assigning, assigning that you know, meaning. So I think that's very interesting. So why is it important you know, to get at the meaning of things? Um, well, when we think strictly about text, um, the volume and complexity is way outpacing our ability to digest and understand and make confident decisions. The health care bill is about 2,000 pages of natural language text. In 2006, the tax code was 16,000 pages. In 2010, it was 71,000 pages. Um, there's hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of thousands of medical textbooks and journals, and they're rapidly changing. Um, the Wikipedia has 4 million articles in it. Uh, I think a print encyclopedia, you know, had like about 85,000. So it's just unbelievable what's going on in the volume of information. And in the end, what does it all mean to me and my needs? When I have a problem or an issue or something I need to understand quickly to take action, how do I sift through all this stuff and really interpret that with respect to my interest? This becomes a harder and harder job when we're, you know, drowning in this information. Search is a, re is a remarkable ca capability, um, but you know, it, it runs thin pretty quickly when I have to look through hundreds or thousands of examples and try to interpret it with regard to my need. Moreover, what am I not seeing? What am I not seeing? Oh, this recall blindness. There may be a ton of stuff out there that's very significant to me, and I'm not even getting there. I'm not even looking at it. So getting at what things mean relative to your needs becomes um, an interesting and challenging problem and requires computers to actually not necessarily generate meaning they're not human but detect meaning classify it with respect to my with respect to my need so the idea of open domain question answering um, is a general problem a classic challenge uh, in, in AI and the key thing that makes it hard is this open domain part meaning I can ask you know anything uh, and um, you're gonna come up with some intelligent you know response Long-standing expectation of science fiction, and there's lots and lots of examples out there. I just listed a few. Um, uh, desk set, which I'm going to show you a little YouTube clip from, because it's just fascinating um, what went on with this when I tell you the story. But you got Star Trek first generation. Of course, you have HAL 1968, um, Knight Rider. Anybody remember Knight Rider? Oh, thank God. Anyway, and um, you had uh, War Games with Matthew Bod Broderick. Anybody remember that one? You know, the computer played tic-tac-toe to learn that it shouldn't do nuclear war. And, um, and like, it needed to play tic-tac-toe to learn that. And then, uh, and, then, and then, of course, Star Trek Second Generation. I love the computer in Star Trek Se Second Generation because I think, th I, you know, they really got that right. I mean, it's, again, there are those, always those episodes where the computer takes on some personality and tries to kill you, but um, for the most part, you know, it's really, a, it's really an information-seeking tool. It dialogues with you, it understands your need, it, it, it starts to give you information, summarizing it, navigating it, and really helps you solve a problem. And I think, you know, that really nails it on ahead of what, what we should expect out of um, a computer that dealt with um, natural language well. I wanna go back to that, um, the last one, sorry. I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so, yeah, so this is just amazing, and this is just FYI, but it's just, it's just too much to resist. In 1957, there was a movie called Desk Set. It starred um, Spencer uh, Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And here's, let me just show you a little clip. So this is the opening of the movie. It says IBM. And Desk Set starring Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And the premise of the movie so how many know about this? how many people know about this movie? Okay. So the premise of the the premise of the movie is this researcher from IBM goes to this company to build a question answering machine. This is 1957, <laughs> and uh, and there's a, and there's a whole staff. Uh, you know, basically the, the company had a research staff. 
that would, you know, try to absorb enormous amounts of information, and, you know, and answer questions. And there was this big concern that it, uh, this machine would put those people out of a job, and can the machine really do, can really, the machine really do the work, and so forth and so on. Absolutely fascinating. And, 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 th and this scene here, you know, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Vepper on, on the roof, and she having lunch, and Spencer Tracy is, is because Catherine Hepburn is the lead uh, librarian there, and um, researcher, librarian, and, and Spencer Tracy is interviewing her to figure out how to program the machine, because the machine's got to mimic her thinking. You know, this is just, this is just too much. So. Okay, so that's just, do you hear what she said? Well, the person's male or female is gender, hysterical. One of the biggest problems we had was gender <laughs> in, in Watson. I mean, we, we, we were doing a sparring game, a practice game, and one of the senior VPs was there, and there was a question where the answer was Richard Nixon, and, we, and, it, and it was um, he blah, 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 and we answered with Pat Nixon. And the senior VP was like, Dave, what are you doing? How could you get that wrong? <laughs> and I was like, gender's not as easy as you think. Uh, it was hard to explain that to him, but um, so so first of all, it's actually quite complicated. Have you ever met Marilyn Manson, or you know? So there's just the, the, so um, so just figuring out whether or not you're referring to a male or female. But then when you realize that you're not perfect at it, uh, so you now you're saying, okay, what's your? Let's say you're you know you're 80 percent of the time you're getting the right gender. Right? So now you, you, you know you're not perfect at it. So now you have to look at all the other information pointing to the answer, and you have to weigh your gender calculations a little bit less because you're not perfect at it. So you have a preponderance of other kinds of evidence. You're going to realize that your gender calculation is not perfect, so that other evidence might outweigh that. But humans put a tremendous amount of, of confidence into the, into the gender uh, vector, right? Because they're pretty sure they get that right. So it looks really stupid when you get a gender when you get a gender, gender question wrong, and so I would say, well, you know, it turns out that Richard Nixon and Pat Nixon were both doing this thing together, and so she's strongly associated with doing the same thing that the question's asking about. That wasn't convincing him. I was saying, but one's a woman and one is a man, Dave. How come you're not getting the gender right? So it was interesting. Able was I, ere I saw Elba. No. But I doubt that Napoleon ever said anything like that. Watch. Uh, unless you mean it's because it's spelled the same way, backward and forward. Is that what you meant? <laughs> <laughs> So she notices it's the palindrome, right? And uh, again, if this, if this wasn't a foreshadowing of IBM building the machine that won a Jeopardy, <laughs> I don't know what is. And this is, and this, you know, again, was, was, was 1957. So it's just, I just had to share that. Um, tremendous uh, foreshadowing. So why is, you know, open domain question answering hard? And why is it easy? And I think you have to think about, well, what kinds of questions, what does it mean for a question to be easy or hard? And again, so much depends on, you know, what you're asking and how you're asking it and what the context is and what you're good at. And it's just very difficult to kind of understand the level of difficulty of a question. Here's one, natural log of 12,546,798 times pi cubed divided by 34,647. Anybody who didn't see the answer flash up before? Um, right, so not so good at it, no? Uh, greater than or less than one, take a bet, 50-50. Um, so anyway, so computers do this really, really well and really, really quickly. This is not a hard question for a computer. How about how much did customer equal Charles Jones spend at store equals electronics between January 2010 and January 2012 for items that cost more than $100 and less than $300? Anybody? Okay. So computers do this really well, too, when the data has been organized in these relational databases and it can navigate these relational databases and it can, it can you, know, predict, you know, get the answer, you know, dead on. And of course, if you change, you know, Chad to Charles, though, right, 
or you put Chad in and what you meant was Charles, the computer's confused, it's going to get it wrong because it doesn't know that Charles is Chad. And this is why when you use databases, you give unique identifiers like social security numbers, so not to confuse the very weak computer because computers really don't know who you're talking about. But again, humans don't either. If I said to you Chad versus Charles, you, you, you have background knowledge that allows you to map those two words, but you wouldn't necessarily know I'm using the same person unless I started giving you more and more information about that person so you could zoom in on who I'm really talking about. Uh, so it gets difficult when you require more and more background information. And here's another kind of example. So here I have, where was X born? Now if I told the computer ahead of time, here's exactly how to interpret this. Do a structured query language, do an SQL query on this database and take whatever you put in X and match it against the first column, the answer is in the second column, and you're done. You could do that really well. But if I don't tell it what the, what, the, um, you know, what the question means at all, and I just said, read some stuff and answer this question, and it reads, one day from among his, his city views of Ulm, Otto chose a watercolor to send to Albert Einstein as a remembrance of Einstein's birthplace. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know what born means. Is born have anything to do with the birthplace? Uh, who are the people, the places? I would have to put a tremendous amount of background information and language processing to interpret that question with regard to that text. This now becomes a much harder sort of problem to, to, to answer. We think of the text as unstructured because I'm not specifying ahead of time what it means relative to the query. Whereas with the table, if you tell me, here's the table, Put, put the X here, the answer is over here, that's structured. I'm telling you ahead of time what the explicit semantics are. So X, another one, just to give you another example, X ran this, right? I don't know what it means, but if I tell the computer, look up the X in the CEO column and the answer is in the, in the company column, I get Jack Welch ran General Electric. But if I don't tell it that, if, and I just read, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. What's that got to do with run, ran? What does ran mean, right? I mean, at best, the computer might interpret that as Jack Walsh was a painter at GE, right, which would be terribly wrong. So you start to see the challenge in bringing in background information, interpret things, and trying to associate them with meaning. So Jeopardy comes along, and, and this, is a, this is a dream job, if you will, for a team who's focused on AI, who wants to advance natural language processing, who wants to figure out how to do open domain question answering better than we've ever done before, because here you have a problem with a broad open domain. So this isn't you know, a table. This isn't a lookup. This isn't an FAQ database. And in fact, this is where you know, the, the human interest in this problem was you know, vastly different. I mean, I actually got interviewed by a radio show host who said, OK, so you're going to do this Jeopardy thing. So let me understand this. You put all the questions into a, into a spreadsheet, and you put all the answers in, and then when the question pops up, you look it up in one column, and then you speak the answer in the second column, right? That, good, good, good thing it was like radio and not television, because you should see my face. And so I was like, no, that's not how you do it. I mean, we don't even, never mind the answers, we don't even know what the questions are going to be ahead of time. And the guy was like, well, then how do you do it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you know, now you're on the, you know, now you're on the right track. Um, so, you know, so, co you know, so open domain, rich, complex language. So if you're standing, it's the direction you should look to check out the Wayne's coding. Just scream out the answer if you know it. Anybody? Wait, you know, so down, so the answer is down. But what's interesting about that, you know, coming from a background of doing formal knowledge representation, so imagine I'm sitting there and thinking, okay, so I want to represent direction. So getting this, I'm never going to get this question again. So putting this question is meaningless. But I could say, well, what if I'm asked about questions about direction? So I'm going to represent direction in the computer. So let's say I have north, south, east, west. I could represent like degrees around a compass. Um, I could represent relative to my position, you know, left, right, so, so and so on, up, down, right. So that's good. So I, you know, maybe I can get that. But now there was another Jeopardy question that said, um, "This is the direction of fabric, blah blah blah," and the answer was grain. Would you have thought to represent direction in, in that way? So very quickly, you as a logicist and a philosopher are just you realize how prejudicial your thinking is and how little you really know. And then you think of what's out there in the vast volumes of text. And when you think of every usage of every word, there's a clue out there somewhere. How do we learn how to exploit the clues that are in those vast volumes of text? Um, seems this perp was the first murderer in the Bible, to, and to top it off, he iced his own brother. How many dictionaries out there have murder as a definition of iced? Not a lot. 
the Urban Dictionary, which is largely pornographic, not good to use on national television. <laughs> and so mitosis, mitosis splits the nucleus, and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. Just scream it out. You guys aren't Jeopardy players, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, cytoplasm. I'll tell you it was so cold today. How cold was it? It was so cold, I wish we were back in 64 when he was emperor. Hot times, if you know what I mean. Excellent. That's amazing. I mean, as a computer, how much of that question do I need to ignore? A lot. Right? How do I know what I need to ignore? Um, uh, let's see. Of the four countries in the world, um, in the world that the U.S. does not have diplomatic relations with, the one that's farthest north. North Korea, that's right, that's great. So, and you have to have very high precision. You gotta get a lot of these things right, but moreover, you have to know what you're getting right because you gotta decide whether you're gonna buzz in. If you buzz in and get that question wrong, you're gonna lose the dollar value associated with that question. So you have to produce a probability that your answer is in fact correct and you have to do that quickly, right? You've gotta get all of this done in about three seconds to be competitive. Right. Jeopardy talked about a tons of things. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm just gonna build this big ontology and I'm gonna I represent everything that they ask about, well, if you look at this you know, frequency chart here, there's a very, very long tail. We, took, we looked at 20,000 um, randomly selected questions. We found about 2,500 distinct types. And even if you kind of tried to represent everything in the head of the tail, you'd cover less than 10% of the data. So there are things out there you know, like um, insect and substance <coughs> and object and disease and dish and vegetable and sign are all roughly equivalent to, to the significance in this, in this domain. So you're just, to cover a lot of data, you've got to start representing enormous amounts of information and every question that can, that can be asked about these things, you're not going to get there that way. So clearly we had to basically use unstructured content, not think about building structured databases. 13% um, of the clues didn't refer to any type. They just said like it or this for it to know type at all. Categories. A lot of people say, oh, well, Jeopardy tells you what the answer is going to be. It's really not true. Uh, here are examples of Jeopardy questions. It says, U.S. cities. The answer uh, for the first one was shuffleboard. Second one was the Erie Canal. Country clubs. The answer was a mace, a baton. Authors. The answer was the Book of Job, Romania. Right, so you people have this misconception. Oh, you, you already know exactly. No, it's not true. In fact, what we learned is it gave some signal but understanding you know, what was referred to in the clue and how the clue was phased gave you a much, more, a, much, a much bigger signal to what we call the answer type you know, might be. Just to understanding the, the question, we would do a natural language parse of the question. So here we have this actor, Audrey's husband, from 1954 to 1968, directed her as Rhyme of the Bird Girl in Green Mansions. What is this question asking for? It's asking for the director of the film Green Mansions. If I knew it was asking that, like if this question was, what is the director of the film, Green Mansions? I, yeah, I can look it up in IBM, IMDb. Um, but I don't know what's going on here. In fact, it says it's asking for an actor, but Mel Farrar is the answer to this question. Really wasn't known as an actor, he was known as a director. Um, do I know Green Mansions is, is, is a film? What, you know, I, you direct can mean a lot of different things. So you parse the sentence, you try to interpret the sentence from a semantics perspective, you try to figure out what refers what you know, in the sentence, what modifies what in the sentence. Is Rima a person, a bird, a girl, a character? What's Green Mansions, a place, a movie, a play, a book, a house? What does from 1954 to 1968 mean? I've got to break that up into time and figure out durations. So there's a lot to do just to figure out what the question's even asking. So how good were humans at this task? So one metric that we came up with, which was a driving metric in this project, um, was what we called a winner's cloud. See all those dots over there? So um, these dots represented actual Jeopardy games. And what we plotted was the performance of the winner of the, of, of the game. And what on the x-axis we plotted how many of the questions the winner had a, um, a shot to answer. Right, so you know, it's a measure kind of of their confidence and their speed. How many questions did they you know, buzz in first for? And so if you look at the center of the kind of this light gray cloud, you're down somewhere around 50, uh, I'm sorry, about 47, 48%. And if you look to the y-axis, this is how many of those questions that the winning player answered did they get right? So they're, you know, they're doing about 80, uh, you know, 85 to 95% right. And these darker ones, that was Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings was like an amazing buzzer. He, he on average, he took 62% of the game, which is a remarkable. He's answering, you know, 70 and 80% of the questions. I mean, this is a game where you don't even know who else is playing. 
right, because he's that dominant, you know, in the game. And he just sort of assumed he knew all things. Unfortunately for his competitors, he was roughly right. Did about <laughs> so this was a state-of-the-art QA system, um, and we sort of spent about three, three weeks kind of adapting it to the Jeopardy-style questions. And everybody thinks, oh, that's what's really hard about Jeopardy, because the way they phrase the questions, not really. Um, that wasn't what was hard about it. It was about, what was hard about it was getting the answers right. <laughs> um, so we adapted it, and we got this kind of, what we call the confidence curve. So the way to read this is imagine we binned all the questions in terms of um, how confident the system was, and then looked at how many we got right. So this is the top 5%. This is the 5% of the questions that the computer was most confident in, got about 47% uh, right. As it answered more and more questions, so you got a larger and larger pool of questions um, that, you know, uh, in general was less and less confident in, it started to flatline here about 13%. So this left a, a really big, big gap. And this is what in, you know, 2007 we said, we're going we're gonna to try to, you know, leap this. We're going to try to take the state of the art and get it there where that line is slicing across the winner's cloud. Um, suggesting that we'd com be competitive. It would depend on who you were playing, it would depend on a bunch of things, but if this confidence curve was going like this, you knew that you, you, were, you, were, you, know, you were in the running. So Lincoln Bloggs, Treasury Secretary Chase just submitted, this to, uh, just submitted this to me for the third time. Guess what, pal, this time I'm accepting it. Anybody? Resignation. So now, do you know the, who, who said resignation? So, do you know the history, or did you use plausible inference? I knew the history. You, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. So, you know, what I mean by plausible inference is you look at this and you use the context. You say, okay, I don't really know the history, but what kinds of things do I submit? What kinds of things do I submit to a president? What kinds of things do I submit to a president um, that is even worth talking about? Right? So you kind of zoom in on the answer, you know, resignation, if you, even if you don't know the history. So you basically use the context to narrow it down. And that's exactly what a sixth grade did. We, we posed this question to a sixth grade, and they came back and they said, <laughs> because that's what the context suggested to them, right? So my answer to that was, you guys need to bone up on your history. But, um, but that's what happens when you use context, you use plausible. This was a very reasonable way to do things, especially when you, know, you had no idea what it was even asking for. You, you had no idea what the answer type even was. Submitted this. I mean, it could be anything. Right? So you want to use the context to you really start to zoom in on what it could it even be. So here's another question, relatively simple question, but I kind of want to make a point about the nature of evidence and, you know, and, and how, that can, you know, how that can vary. So here we have in May 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's, explorer's arrival in India. And we can take a, take a t keyword perspective. And if you put this in Google, the answer probably comes up. This is kind of a, a featured fact a lot of people learn in, in, in uh, gra uh, grammar school, if not high school. Uh, anybody know the answer? Bosco da Gama is, in fact, you know, we have like a, 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 sh a should have been Jeopardy player over here, but yeah, so <laughs> Bosco, Bosco da Gama is the right answer. Um, but, you know, you could imagine confusers like, you know, like, for example, Christopher Columbus around the same time associated with Portugal and so forth. Um, thought he went to India just as good. So, um, but so just to make that point, imagine this uh, paragraph. In May, Gary arrived in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal. It's a great passage. It's got all the key words, and it suggests that Gary's the explorer, right? And who's to say Gary's not an explorer, right? I mean, after all, I mean, you, you, Gary, you, the next sentence could read, and Gary returned home to explore his attic looking for a photo album, right? right? So you think, well, there's this hard taxonomy of who's an explorer and who's isn't. But the, who isn't? That's not true. If you're, the, if you're the subject of the verb to explore, you're an explorer. But a human looks at this and says, wait a second, I mean, a whole country is celebrating the anniversary. This has got to be an explorer that I'm familiar with, one of the three I learned about in high school, Bosco da Gama, Christopher Columbus, or Gary, you know. Um, <laughs> so same question, but now I have a different passage. On the 27th uh, of May, 1498, Bosco da Gama landed in Capit Beach. So this question only has one uh, keyword in common, may, which means tons of things and it's all over the place. So how do I interpret that potential passage? That, well, first of all, why would I even look at that passage? Right? So, you know, it's rare that search would even bring up that passage. Um, all it's got in common is may, so why would I even look at it? Moreover, once I had it, how would I assess it? 
as answering the question. So one way to kind of even assess it is the first, and you know, now I'm going to foreshadow how Watson worked, is take that query and just do a bunch of searches and generate lots of possible answers. So Gary might be there, Christopher Columbus might be there, Vasco da Gama might be there, Magellan might be there, a whole bunch of things. It's like 500 possible hypotheses. Now I want to go out and given that hypothesis, pretend that might be the right answer. So now bring back everything I know about that possible answer. I have a hundred, I might bring back tons of little bits of evidence. And now for each one of them, I want to dig in and try to understand that evidence. So now I'm asking, so let's say as one of the possible hypotheses, I generated Vasco da Gama among many, and now I get this passage. And by the way, Vasco da Gama can be referred to lots of different ways. That's tricky. So now I bring back this passage, and now I want to assess, does this passage really support Vasco da Gama as the answer? How do I do that? Well, you know, one score, one possible score is keywords. It's only got one keyword in common. What else you got? Right, so now start thinking that what the team did was generate many, many different algorithms that looked at that data from different perspectives. Keywords is one, geography is another, time is another. Right, so I have all these different algorithmic techniques assessing this from different perspectives to try to match what the meaning, if you will, so it's not really interpreting the meaning, it's kind of doing meaning equivalence. This is a question mean sort of the same thing that's going on in that passage. So with temporal reasoning, I connect, I connect 400th anniversary in 1898 to 1498. With statistical paraphrasing, I could get some signal that arrived in and landed in. It might mean the same thing because I could look at the context that they both exist in similar contexts. I'm not 100% sure. Um, arriving in Capit Beach, I arrived in India if I refer to a geographical database. So now I get some signal that Vasco da Gama might be the answer. Can I find evidence that Vasco da Gama is an explorer? I can. I can find a lot more evidence. In fact, more evidence that he's considered an explorer than I could find about Gary. So I start to build up stronger evidence, and I weigh that evidence relative to keyword evidence, which could be weaker. And I sit there and I say, OK, I think, I'm thinking Vasco da Gama is a better answer than Gary. Am I 100% sure? No. No way. Not even close, because all these algorithms can make a mistake. They all have sort of an intrinsic confidence or weighting that we learn about them. And we use machine learning to do that. So um, this kind of gives you a preview of how Watson works. Now, making connections, this was a, you know, here's another Jeopardy question. On, the, on hearing of the discovery of George Mallory's body, he told reporters he still thinks he was first. Anybody know? Edmund Hillary is right. But what's interesting about this question is that it's kind of missing something. Like, you, you inferred something else that's not in the question, and then you went from that to Edmund Hillary. Right? You looked at that and you went, Mount Everest. Mount Everest was the missing link, right? So George Mallory, you said, what do I know about George Mallory? Now, humans know not that much about George Mallory. You know what they know about George Mallory? Mount Everest. But a computer starts uh, reading about George Mallory, and there's tons of stuff about George Mallory. Why Mount Everest? Right, so first you have to kind of zoom in on what's the most relevant thing and then make the connection at who was first on Mount Everest and you come up with Edmund Hillary. So this starts to get sort of interesting because you imagine that the computer now is doing kind of this, this iterative search to build a chain of inference where each link along that chain, it could start to justify that link with some passage of evidence it found. So this, this was a precursor of what became Watson Paths. Um, which is one of the things that you know, IBM is now using in the medical space. So how are we, so we going to solve this problem? So one thing, we weren't going to build a big, giant, common sense ontology. Um, we knew that we were going to use intelligence from lots of different diverse methods. In other words, there wasn't going to be like one PhD who's going to come up with Maxwell's equations for QA. There are going to be a lot of guys, some guys who are experts in syntactic parsing, some guys who are experts in semantic interpretation, some guys who are experts in understanding time and negation and geography. So lots of different experts looking at, some people looking at rule-based methods, some people looking at statistical methods, all developing their algorithms. Then we're going to balance this diverse set of algorithms and see if we can get a signal for whether or not this passage is supporting or refuting um, a potential answer. And the other thing is, when you reason about that architecture, when you think about it, you're, you're starting from a single question, you're doing a bunch of searches, from each search you're generating a whole bunch of answers, and then from each answer you're now generating more searches, and then for each of those searches you're now looking at 100 algorithms analyzing that. This is an enormous computation, but it's embarrassingly parallel. I could branch out at each of those stages. Or once I do that initial question, I branch out and get, let's say, 100 possible answers. I can independently now go try to prove, quote unquote, 
um, whether each of those answers are right. And once I go out for each of those answers and I get a bit of evidence supporting or refuting that answer, I can now, I can now analyze each one of those independently of the other ones. And then once I get all those scores, millions of scores potentially, I can now weigh them all and do a linear combination and predict uh, whether or not my answer is right. But that's a huge fan out. So that's embarrassingly parallel. So we knew to get this done in time, we were going to have to spread this out over many, many cores and do this parallel computation. So this is the overall architecture for, for, for Watson. Um, it goes from question analysis to decomposition to generating many possible answers to doing uh, sort of initial gross filtering, then to finding evidence and scoring it, and then for merging all the answers in the end where you balance all those things. But there's this great video that IBM did, and you probably have not seen it because it was not as popular as the games, but it does a really good job explaining this. Maybe you could, I don't know if you could lower the lights, it would be good. Presented in the tricky Jeopardy format, that can be pretty difficult for a person to understand, much less a computer. Remember, a computer understands codes, ones and zeros, not nouns and verbs or people and places, let alone the relationships between them. Watson can't hear here, so audio and visual questions are off limits, but everything else is fair game. And of course, it's impossible to know everything. As Alex Trebek often quips, the hardest Jeopardy question is the one you don't know. How does a computing system reach a single answer to clues posed in human language? Unlike traditional databases designed for computers, real language is implicit and vigorous and full of complexity. That's one of the reasons why, until now, computer searches have only spit out documents filled with keywords. It's been up to us to find the answers in those documents. Like our brain, Watson's knowledge base is entirely self-contained, except while our brain fit in a shoebox. Watson's brain takes up more space than eight large refrigerators. <coughs> when Watson answers a Jeopardy question, there is no internet or helpline, so Watson consumes a steady diet of information to prepare for a game. Watson needs to absorb so much information because Jeopardy is open domain, which means it can ask a question about anything. So it's two million, about, about two million books worth. It's much less than most people think. It was 100 gigabytes of text. On a web scale, that's almost nothing. But it's a, it's, for a human scale, it's you know, roughly equivalent to two million books. Actually, a lot of information. This is all text, no images. Um, and once Watson analyzed it, in other words, parsed all those sentences and associated semantics with it as best it could, it grew to about 10x that, roughly a terabyte. Of, uh, of data. But what's interesting is that while there was a terabyte of expanded or analyzed data, Watson used 15 terabytes of RAM to actually do the computation to figure out what the answer to the question was, to do it that fast. It didn't go to, it didn't go to any disk. It actually used 15 terabytes of RAM. Content written in the way humans communicate before it gets anywhere near a game board. Never before in the history of computing has a machine been able to so precisely answer such a wide breadth of questions in such a short time. Let's see how Watson does it. Step one, question analysis. The first thing Watson does is parse the question into its parts of speech and identify the different roles the words and phrases in the sentence are playing. This helps Watson determine two distinct things. What type of question is being asked? and what the question is asking for. So what's nice about this, this is roughly accurate, at least at the time that this video was made. This is, so this is the parsing of the sentence. So you're seeing the milliseconds go by there. This is roughly accurate. You know, how long it would take. Let's parse a second. And, and, yeah, so we need, and this is, again, this is on 2,880 cores, 15 terabytes of RAM. Watson doesn't know how to find the best answer yet, so it increases its chances by looking at many different options of what the question might be asking for. Step two, hypothesis generation. For each interpretation of the question, Watson quickly searches through hundreds of millions of documents to come up with thousands of possible answers. At this point, quantity trumps accuracy. It's more important for Watson to generate a large number of possible answers 
and narrow them down from there. Because if the correct answer isn't included during the initial sweep, there is no possible way for Watson to identify and justify the right answer at the end. Step three, hypothesis and evidence form. Of course, it's not enough for Watson to just come up with answers. It has to support and defend them. So after downgrading an obviously wrong answer, Watson finds passages from many different sources to collect positive and negative evidence for all of the remaining possibilities. Watson understands these passages having learned the relationships between words. Relationships such as books have heroes or authors create characters. Scoring algorithms then rate the quality of this evidence based on everything from the source material's reliability to whether the time and location appear correct. There are still hundreds of possible answers left, so thousands of algorithms work in parallel to score the evidence for each and every one of them. Remember, this much happens in a second. Step four, final merging and ranking. Different types of evidence are better at solving the so this, this, is the, this gives you sort of a depiction of just some of the classes of algorithms. So things that will look um, for, you know, passage, message, temporal information, precise versus absolute, question class detection, you know, keyword search, relation detection. So all these different, there were about a hundred of these things that were developed and refined over a four year period that would all report a score. And then we would use statistical machine learning to figure out what the weights on those scores are. So just like a person learned from practice, Watson uses the experience it gained from trying to answer similar questions in order to weigh the importance of its different types of evidence. It's not about memorizing trivia. By playing thousands of practice games, Watson learns how to weigh, apply, and combine its own algorithms to help decide the degree to which each piece of evidence is useful or not. These weighted evidence scores are merged together to decide the final ranking for all of the possible answers with the highest ranked answers appearing in order on Watson's answer panel. In Jeopardy, contestants lose money if they buzz in with the wrong answer. So Watson estimates its confidence as to whether or not its top answer, along with every other answer possibility, is correct. <coughs> this confidence is based on how high the answer is rated during evidence scoring and ranking. If Watson's confidence for its top answer is low, under 50%, for example, then Watson won't answer. This is an important step for computing. Watson knows what it knows, and it knows what it doesn't know. There is no fixed confidence level deciding whether or not Watson buzzes in. The threshold is constantly changing based on how well Watson is doing relative to the other player and how much money is left on the board. In this case, Watson arrived at its answer with a 78% confidence. For that stage of the game, it was a high enough confidence level to buzz in and it won Watson $800 in the process. Who wins? Paragonia. Okay, you can put the lights back on. So, that's actually very, um, to, you know, we work with the firm to do that video. That was actually a very nice uh, description of what went on uh, in, you know, in, in the processing. And the, I think, you know, what, and I'll say this in a bit, but I think what was really sort of unique about what we did was the architecture and the methodology allowed us to kind of rapidly advance all these various algorithms. Uh, and we were able to do that very, you know, very, very quickly. And there was a certain philosophy around doing this. You know, traditionally, you know, researchers want to work on their parser. You know, I'm going to get my parser, for example, one of their components from, you know, 92 to 94 and publish a paper. And I was like, no, 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 no. So before we invest in that, let's understand whether or not getting your parser from 92 to 94 is going to have any impact whatsoever on actually making the system do anything better. And so we'd have to, so the researchers in general had to follow this discipline that said, let's assume I were able to do this and simulate and say, what impact would it have before I actually invested in that, in that agenda? And they all work together to do that. And as I said, many, many different researchers working on different algorithms. And the main use of machine learning was figuring out how to balance the, all those various you know, algorithms. So that was kind of the idea. Watson, just to give you a sense, another sense of why this thing was a challenge, this is you know, growing pain. So it wasn't like we set up that architecture, turned the machines on, and presto, we answered all the questions right. 
In fact, going into the final game, Watson had, and we had very good simulations, Watson had about somewhere in the low 70s, about a 70, 72% chance of winning. So I had a 30 to 28% chance of losing my job, is basically, <laughs> so in that final game. So it was a nail-biting you know, game. De uh, decades before Lincoln, Daniel Webster spoke of government made for, made by, and answerable to them. Anybody know? People very good. Watson's answer was no one. Again, this is a very early, very early, ver very early version, you know, of Watson. But it, you know, you don't understand. It's like you know, when a senior vice president's looking at that, they're like, "Oh my God, we're dead!" You know, I'm looking at that. I'm going, "That's not bad." <laughs> um, so, uh, so an exclamation point was warranted for the end of this in 1918. Anybody? World War One. Very good, Watson. A sentence. Um, you know, so does it really matter what year? I mean, it, you know, it ends a sentence. Um, yeah, World War I was the right answer. Um, in 1994, 25 years after this event, one participant said, for one crowning moment, we were creatures of the cosmic ocean. Apollo moon landing, very good. Watson, the Big Bang. Now, not a lot of people around to come in on the Big Bang, but again, you know, at the stage we were in the project, I looked at it and said, yes, we answered with an event. Awesome. Um, it was the wrong answer, but... Uh, the Queen's English, give a Brit a tinkle when you get into town and you've done this. Telephone, Watson, urinate. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, one of my favorites was, uh, you know, this was uh, granted a fairly early version, but nonetheless, it's just too funny, is the, this Frenchman was the father of bacteriology. Pasteur. Pasteur. Watson. <laughs> How tasty was my little Frenchman. Uh, yeah, so... It was it was wrong. Um, so over the so about uh, you know about uh, 25 scientists and software uh, scientists and software engineers total, uh, key university partners, building on realized decades of work in NLP. I mean we, you know we were using a partial that was in development at IBM for 30 years. We had been doing research in this space for a very long time. You know we knew a lot of the latest techniques and we you know so, it's not like we came out of nowhere and, and did this uh, you know two guys in a garage. Um, we built, you know, really built on a lot of uh, what was out there. But we did um, do it in a very different way. We did uh, organize this, this team. I organized this team all in one room. No publications. We said no publications for four years. We're just going to try to, you know, make, do something really, really big and learn from that one way or the other. So as scientists, we took a risk. Uh, and we committed to doing that. And IBM really backed, you know, backed the science in a really big way. There was a big upside for the, the corporation getting out there and doing something impressive. Um, so we just organized differently. The incentives were different. Uh, the methodology of research was different. The combination of engineering and, uh, and management and science was very different. Uh, and we moved that line uh, from that baseline all the way up to here. Uh, where you're slicing across the winner's cloud. And this was competitive enough to win. And then through simulations, we, as I said, we, we, we calculated we had somewhere between a 70 and, you know, 72, 73% chance of winning, of winning that final game, of winning that final game. Um, we already talked about this, but very interesting to compare the machine, you know, for, now from an AI perspective, you know, 2,880 CPUs, a brain, 10 refrigerators, your brain fits in a shoebox, 80 kilowatts of electricity, you need to power it, tuna for sandwich, glass of milk, 20 tons of cooling, you know, a hand fan, um, four years and about two million books worth of content, 30 years of human learning. But you know what? The human can walk in on their own and actually tell a joke or two. So, um, you know, the, the human brain is, you know, has, is something really to kind of marvel at. So that was kind of a fascinating uh, thing. For those of you who don't know, you know, Watson actually had to push down the button because we needed sort of equivalent interfaces. So if a human had to push a plastic button on a spring, the computer had to push down a plastic button on a spring. So we actually created you know, Watson's little hand there to do that. So the rest is kind of history. But one of the things I kind of want to point out is that this communication, this answer panel thing, was just huge. This was so important to get people to kind of get a sense of what was really going on. Because without that, and I, you know, and I did my formal study with my own family, IBM had to go out and do a big film or usability study, but I was like, if you don't put that answer panel up there, no one knows what's going on. And they're gonna get the completely the wrong interpretation. They're gonna think you're looking up the answers in a spreadsheet. They're just not gonna know what's going on. And I was dead right about that. When people saw this, oh, it's, it's computing something. It, it has different possibilities and it's computing a probability. And, and it just kind of turned the impression on its head where people started thinking, you know, 
there's a computer kind of thinking and trying to understand, um, not just looking something up in a table. It was a huge impact. In fact, I showed a practice game without the answer panel and, uh, to my family. My kid, seven-year-old kid, the same one who thought interesting meant boring. When Watson wouldn't answer, which was brilliant when it wouldn't answer, because it was actually thinking, I'm not really sure here, right? Seven-year-old kid, knew really nothing about computers, sat there and she turned around to me and said, Watson, did Daddy crash? I mean, Watson, Daddy crash. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> she said, Daddy, did Watson crash? Because that was the impression. If the computer wasn't responding, it was dead. Right? That was the, the, you know, the impulse. As opposed to, wow, it's really not sure. It's actually holding back and doesn't want to answer, which was a much more intelligent response. Right? So how do you perceive intelligence? It was really fascinating. So that we got that answer, we got them to Jeopardy put that answer panel on television. It was, it was a huge, huge thing. So what were the kind of the reflections? I mean, I think this was a triumph for the notion of a general systems architecture. We didn't, and this has a large part to do with kind of, you know, my view of AI and, and my sort of um, investment for years over the field and in the team. There was a big focus on architecture and engineering. We, had, we didn't sit there and say, oh, we're going to just solve Jeopardy. We're actually going to build a general, you know, systems architecture that had this notion of analysis and generating hypotheses and collecting evidence and scoring evidence. Um, a triumph for the combining of a diversity of methods. So there was one no algorithm that knew how to do the job. There are many, many algorithms that looked at the data from different perspectives, very reminiscent of you know, uh, Minsky's thesis and the book he did, Society of Mind. Uh, changing the expectations of the human-machine interface. There was this you know, notion that you know, you, computers look stuff up in a database and never got anything wrong. If I put in my, uh, you know, my social security number, I got back my address, period. You know? But here we said, you know what? We have to deal with, the, with uncertainty. We may have problems, and we do, especially with massive data, where you know, we face incomplete and imprecise data. The data is not perfect, the algorithms are not perfect, but the computer can still provide value. And this was this you know, notion what the answer panel got people to appreciate what was going on. So it's kind of changed people's expectation about what should the man-machine interface be. And I think it kind of woke people up in, in the healthcare space because um, you know, people came to me right after the while and said, what do we do with this? And I said, healthcare is a really interesting place because there's a lots of unstructured content. There's lots of connections to be made. Um, it's very hard to memorize all this stuff. This is a place where you know, computers could really play a role, where we failed no, I shouldn't say fail, but we failed to make enough of an impact with classic expert systems if we could improve upon you know, search and do more of this precise connecting the dots on unstructured content. We could potentially help in diagnosis and evaluating treatments. And I, uh, IBM eventually did take it in that direction. And I think that was uh, you know, sort of a very uh, positive direction. Um, I'm, I'm probably out of time, uh, but I have like one more point I, I, I wanted to make, and so I just wanted to pause. Is it okay to kind of keep going in that direction? Yeah, so I wanted to take you into this. You know, so I sort of stepped back and reflected on Watson and what I thought really the real value points were there. But I now want to take another, uh, a step even higher and just look at AI in general. You know, AI when I started was sort of very theory driven. You would, you would look at small data because you didn't have access to huge amounts of data. And you'd generate some ideas, some hypotheses, and you build a theory. Hypotheses, and you build a theory. You know, the world looks like this. Um, and you'd write down your concepts and your relationships. And then you use that theory as a way to kind of predict things. So then you use deduction. So a, a lot of the, the 70s and the 80s were invested in building these ontologies and these formal representations, these axiomatic if-then rules that would describe a problem. And then you'd look at more and more complex logics for reasoning about that. And you'd use deductive inference mechanisms to come up with these predictions. But the predictions were explicable. Because you could say, here's the answer. And I could explain the answer in terms of my theory, which was kind of cool. The problem was that this was very brittle. This was a big bottleneck. Going to having humans build and maintain this theory was very difficult, very slow, very brittle. Your predictions were explicable, explainable with regard to the theory, but you had a very narrow, somewhat brittle system. Um, as more and more massive amounts of data became available and more, and more compute power became available and machine learning, statistical machine learning techniques, inductive techniques became more and more powerful, we were able to process this really big data. And now we can make predictions. Um, but powerful predictions over lots and lots of data, but they were inexplicable, and they are inexplicable. So we're really looking for correlations, and we could generate all these hypotheses because we could generalize from those patterns and tell you, well, if all this and this occurs, then it's going to rain. Um, I don't really, really know what's going on, but statistically speaking, 
Um, we use this in economics a lot. But you know, very often these predictions are not explainable with regard to a theory. But that knowledge acquisition bottleneck faded away because I'm getting the computer to do an enormous amount of work here, but it's sort of an inexplicable result. And also one of the problems is you can get these spurious correlations that really are wrong or they're only right some of the time because they're really just taking past and they're assuming the past is going to predict the future. And that happens sometimes, but not all the time. Watson actually did something a little bit different. Watson didn't take the questions and do a statistical model to answers. Something a little bit different. It was used statistics to balance all those algorithms, but the hard part was coming up with those algorithms that analyze the language. Remember I showed you that missing link question? So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things uh, we did was look at a question. This is a question from a United States Medical Licensing Exam broke it up into individual things, like we have a 63-year-old, we have a resting tremor, we have uh, um, unexpressive face, difficulty in walking, continuous movement in the left hand, and the left, uh, we have the tremor in the left hand, but now the whole arm, etc. So we just take all that stuff, and we say, we ask uh, Watson, what does this indicate? What does it cause? What does it suggest? What does it imply? Just like questions like that. And and then depending on the, the confidence of the answers that come back, we get like a thick line that this stuff leads to Parkinson's disease. And, and then we can aggregate, we can, we can propagate that confidence. And then we can ask another question, same set of questions. What does that suggest? What does that cause? And now if you had a bunch of hypotheses down here, you could do the same thing but in the opposite direction and see where things meet in the middle. Use Bayesian inference to propagate those confidences. And note that most of the confidence pools around, in this case, Substantia nigra. This is a uh, United States Medical Licensing Exam. And that was, in fact, the right answer. But you'll notice that Watson, there wasn't this expectation, like it was for many of the Jeopardy clues, but not the missing link ones, that the answer was like one hop. Here you had the expectation that it was two, three, or four hops. And by doing that, you can answer many more of, of these, ki these kinds of questions. And what's interesting, though, is you get this inferential path, like, you would, what, like what you would want out of a, uh, an, uh, an expert system. But I didn't write a single if-then statement. I didn't build a theory. I have no idea about the domain. But a human can look at this and read this and go, oh, I see why you went from there to Parkinson's disease. Oh, and I read this and this, and I see you why you went from there to there. So you get a form of explanation because it was able to pick out text that linked those two things. This is a very interesting sort of in-between model um, for we, you know, from these two things. I don't get this, I don't get this black box prediction. I don't have a domain theory, but I can use existing text to find this inferential path. Very, very cool. I think where we ultimately want to go with AI is kind of this whole brain um, view that says, you know what? We want the computer to help with, with oops, we want the computer to help with in, you know, induction over large data, but we also want to build and maintain theories. So we can get the computer to, to generate many hypotheses by looking at massive data, but we can also sit there and, and generate theories and refine theories so that when we produce predictions, we can produce them from the theory. So we can actually get explicable results that we can explain with regard to theories. And we think this is true because you know, this, you know, the, you know, the, eco the economy works this way or because this disease affects this and we understand you know, what the various pathways are. Um, but I don't want to get stuck in the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. So I want to actually get the machine to implement this loop. Okay, to look at massive data, connect to initial theories, grow and refine theories, um, test that against the data, and kind of get this thing to go. And I think that that, that view, if we had that view, because we were, we were at one extreme with purely theory driven when we couldn't do the induction, Another extreme, when we have purely data-driven, we can't explain the results. We want to sort of shoot for somewhere in the middle that gets the machine to help you connect the inductive and deductive processes. That would be really cool. That's one of the things that excites me about the, the next phase in this journey. Anyway, thank you. So it was mo mostly unstructured text. There were some structured databases in there. And when we can reduce either a question or a sub-question to a structured query, like remember we talked about you know, is, is Caput Beach you know, in India? 
So that's something where, you know, if I got to that point where I understood exactly what I wanted to know and I could map it consistently to a structured database that I had, it would go and it would do that. Are you in concept like direction? So no. So the other thing we would do, no. So the other thing we would do, well, yes or no, it depends on you know what you're thinking, <laughs> understanding each other. But so the other thing we would do is cl we would use structured things to classify stuff. So you know, is this you know uh, an animal or a disease or whatever? So we would um, use uh, taxonomies like WordNet, for example, or other sort of taxonomies. Um, uh, to classify things. We would also induce taxonomies from looking at text. So we would take um, like, you know, is a strings and say, does the text talk about what is something else? So we would do that and then use those taxonomies to decide, well, if this thing is an animal, then it might be an answer to the question. So there was that kind of structured inference. But there, was, there were not deep domain models of anything. I mean, it would just take too long to build those domain models. And this, but th so that limited us to answering certain questions that require deeper reasoning. And this goes back to where I would like to go, which is, can I find a way to kind of grow those, to induce those domain models, refine them, you know, that would use data to try to induce them and then refine them and structure them and get that, that cycle going, you know, between those two parts of the problem. I'm good, thanks. Hey, my name is Bobo. Thank you so much for coming out. This was a super awesome talk. Uh, I like the distinction you made between humans creating meaning and machines detecting meaning. And uh, I have a question, I hope it makes sense. So the Jeopardy Watson that you outlined for us came up with a determinant answer space. I, when I answer a question phenomenally, my experience is that my answer space is indeterminate, which allows me to make statements where I reason in a particular direction, conclude that that direction is incorrect, and then say, oh, this just occurred to me, where that this that just occurred to me was not available to me at the beginning of that process. So my answer space is indeterminate. Uh, also, as an artist, that lets you make connections that seem weird to other people, but then you redefine what the terms were in the question by pushing through what seems irrational or seems illogical to others, right? Because my answer space is indeterminate to me, it allows me to make these fuzzy connections which redefine the original term. So what you so can what, Watson do that? Like, so what you, you what you describe is very similar to, to um, the past stuff, like the missing link stuff, because so really. You described, an iterative, oh, you described an iterative process. Sorry, going the wrong direction again. She describes kind of an iterative process. So I want to go back to this um, question on the, on the missing link thing, yeah. She describes kind of an iterative process. So like for example here, we didn't generate uh, Edmund Hillary yet as an answer. Um, we went to Mount Everest, just like you said, you know, I thought about this, and then from there, so now I actually engage the process again, and then went from Mount Everest to Edmund Hillary. So, so yes, it, in, the, in the video, it says, you know, I did this first pass, and that's all I looked. But when you think about this iterative thing, like also in the medical description, I'm actually doing multiple passes. Why are you so confident about your conscious uh, interest? I'm not, I'm not awareness of how you solve these problems. I have zero confidence. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you forgot to let me know your confidence level. You asked the question. How much of this is time bound versus um, uh, ability bound? In other words, if, if instead of finishing in under three seconds, you gave Watson 30 seconds, what would those So I, w I wish I had a good answer to that, and I don't. I'll tell you why. Because the entire thing was engineered to do it in three seconds. And, and who knows what we would have come up with right. if we knew we had 30 seconds. Yeah. It would be interesting to know in this system, for a given question, is it possible for Watson to get it right, even if he's not racing against Right. The so we would do that kind of analysis. For example, we'd sit there and do, you know, there's no way we, in other words, it just wasn't like, we would have things like, what wasn't even in our recall? Right. There was no way we could have just pulled this up from what we saw, you know, in the question. And of course, you can expand the question and you could say, okay, I want to, I want to come up with many more interpretations of the question, but then you get flooded with information and then it would be hard to pick it out. But but you know, of course, that's kind of the interesting place to go, in my opinion, is because that that pushes your ability to interpret and connect, you know, concepts. And I think if we continued I mean, very quickly, you know, at IBM, the, the direction went into applying this. Um, uh, you know, I, I think if I had my way, I, I would have went much deeper in, into in, into that that sort of space um, and and things like that. But that's, you know, the victim of your own success, I guess. And the flip side of that is, if you weren't confident about your answer, like, would it be possible for Watson to generate 
a question for more information. Again, that's oh yeah, of course. And in you Jeopardy know, you can't and, do, right? and, and this is like this was the artificial nature of Jeopardy, right? I mean, I mean, you know, more than half the time, Watson would have liked to turn around, anthropomorphizing Watson, and I shouldn't, but Watson would have liked to turn around and say, uh, "Alex, by APB, did you mean?" <laughs> So, um, right, because it knew where, you know, when it broke things down, it, it knew where it had low confidence in some interpretation, and all it had to do was, you know, was some help in disambiguating something, or did you mean, you know, this particular guy, because I have two possibilities here. Um, when you say he, are you really, you know, so, um, you know, so, yes, absolutely, and in the real world, in real applications, you could do that. You, know, you could dialogue to disambiguate and to kind of direct, you know, do you find that there are certain domains that are just intrinsically harder for Watson that humans are good at? So if, if I were designing the Jeopardy questions and I wanted Ken Jennings to win, could I do it? Yeah. <laughs> what are the, what are, what's the type of thing that Watson is not as good at? Well, so again, I mean, it's similar to that question, which is the problem is ultimately bounded by, you know, by the data. And in fact, I'll I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, so when we would do the, um, I'm, I, I I am going to answer this question. So when we would do the, you know, the tests, we would we would we would randomly sample the data, like all the various questions, and we'd run the algorithms to see how they performed. Um, and um, and I used to talk to the team all all the time about how the Jeopardy game is like a uh, a living thing. It's constantly evolving. It's changing, and um, you know it, it represents a very general problem, which was great. I mean, it was specific along some dimensions, but in the scheme of things, it was a really interesting general problem to attack. And because it, it was con you know constantly changing, and it was there was not formulaic. You know, questions were not formulaic. So um, all of a sudden, one of the guys was like, "Crap." It's always changing. We need to order the data chronologically. So uh, he ordered it chronologically, and here was our performance at the time. Let's say this is where you know this is where I had been reporting our performance for the senior vice president on a regular basis. And now we're, the data is ordered chronologically. And in 2003, we're like this. Holy crap! <laughs> so now I had to get up to the senior vice president and said we're 10 points off where we thought we were because the game had changed in 2003. It had changed. We didn't know it changed. It didn't formally change. But the language, the way they did things, whatever it was, you know, had changed. And, you know, we have ideas uh, about what changed, you know, from a human perspective. Now, the Jeopardy players didn't get any worse, but then again, they were selected for who can answer these questions. So for all I know, they did, the Jeopardy players even changed. Um, but from the data, they were doing no worse you know, post-2003 and then before 2003. Um, so the questions got more entertaining. They got fancier. They used words like perp and iced. Those were some of the challenges. So, so we had to adapt, basically. So we threw out all post-2003, uh, pre-2003 data. It was basically a different game. And we climbed and we, you know, climbed that thing, you know, again, adjusting for all these various kinds of problems that we saw. Um, so I think the reality is that, you know, we, we, built a general architecture and a general approach. We had many general purpose NLP algorithms, but they were tuned, you know, how they were tuned was very much defined by you know, the, the data and how we perceived that. Um, so, uh, example, those missing link questions were harder for the computer. Um, that's where, you know, I ended up pushing the project to those mis missing link questions for medicine, but they were harder. Um, SA, like SAT type questions. Yes, I can program a computer to do SAT type questions, but on Jeopardy, they came up so rarely that we did not invest in that. So, you know, what we invested in, uh, you know, was very much where the balance of questions were, for, you know, with, with, with the data. And so you can go and you could find those questions we were really poor at and say, we're going to ask those. You know, you, you can't do that. But by and large, you know, human players did that too. Human players sat there and said, you know, I'm going to look at a bunch of Jeopardy games and I'm going to study what I think is going to come up. I'm curious what, what you have to say about um, the potential applications for health and medicine with Watson. You brushed on that a little bit, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more the about potential, The potential? Potential applications yeah. for this. I mean, obviously, you, know, you could reformat uh, a system like that of a 
it could be spoken in real language, but you could get somebody to fill out a checklist of symptoms and then you could get it. Yeah, so, so you know, I mean, so where I see it is I, I really like what the, the mentality is so at the Cleveland Clinic um, because their view of even edu educating um, medical students is this idea that, you know, why are we memorizing stuff? Why are professors getting up and lecturing and everybody sits there and trying to take in notes and memorizing everything he said? That's just not the real world anymore. Uh, their perspective is, you know, you have all these tools, you have search, you can find this information. Let's really educate people on how to reason about, you know, medical problems, um, how to prioritize, how to find stuff, and how to have the general framework, medical knowledge, to reason about what they're reading. Um, and when you take that perspective, now you say, well, how do we help doctors do a better job at diagnosis? How do they fail at diagnosis? Usually because they're too narrow. Um, they don't consider enough, you know, possibilities. Um, how do they fail at evaluating treatments? You know, how do they, where do they fail? And how do we improve the tools so that we can attack those, fa those failures? And, and what, I, what I like about, you know, the Watson Pass stuff that I showed you is basically a more powerful search tool that lets them, you know, consider many, so many hypotheses. So now you could drag in and you say, well, could this be it? Could that be it? Can you find me a path through the literature that suggests that this is potentially the problem? What am I missing? Can you just do a big search, come up with 20 possible? Oh, I never even thought of that. Now let me read the path you could find to, that suggests that that's the answer. And then the human can do the deeper processing of the language and say, oh, you know, oh, you know, Watson, you were silly about this. Okay, fine, but at least I got you to look, you know, in that direction. So that's where I think a tool like this, think of it a more, uh, a more powerful search tool that can connect, you know, input symptoms to, um, to different hypotheses uh, as you know, a way to start, you know, thinking about how, you know, doctors can just broaden their perspective, miss things less, consider more possibilities in the evidence behind those possibilities. So facilitating that in general. Yeah, both for Watson and uh, both for Jeopardy and also for the medical applications. Are there IP <coughs> obstacles in building the database from which you... Yeah, so, I mean, I have to speak at, 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 at people at IBM who are commercializing this, more details about that. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, there are issues about the data, right? So if you, if you, you know, a lot of hospitals have their own private protocols and their own private data that they use and they consider, um, you know, powerful and so, uh, and important to them and proprietary. And so they want to, you know, so they end up getting sort of a private Watson thing and, and there's all, all business models around that and, and you'd have to talk to the IBM folks to even kind of understand that at this point. I don't know that, but you're right, in general there are issues. With Jeopardy, we use all open source you know, data. Uh, I, I should say we use open source data or we license things, um, specific things. Uh, so we did do that, yeah. Well, they already came, so a ton of stuff came out. Um, there was an IBM Systems Journal that had 17 papers in it, and you could get that. Um, and then the team published, uh, in addition to those 17 papers, there's somewhere around another 10 or 20 papers that came out, so in different conferences and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so after four years, everyone was allowed to publish. In fact, most of 2011 um, and, 2000, and you know, part of 2012 was really spent, you know, the team was just heads down writing, you know. How does this thing apply to the macroeconomics? So um, Watson's not being applied in macroeconomics. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in macroeconomics because um, I'm interested in, you know, the, what I talked about before about, you know, th theory and data. And so I'm very interested in, you know, if you, had, if you wanted to explain your, predi your, your predictions um, in the economic sp space, can you develop a macroeconomic theory uh, and where you can basically continually refine and, uh, and extend that theory based on what you're observing in the data, so you're connecting the induction, but ultimately you have a deductive process for you know, predicting things, so you could explain them. So, and I, I, I see macroeconomics at a well where the theory is, is well enough um, uh, bounded uh, and there's enormous amounts of data that there's an opportunity to kind of experiment in that space. So I'm interested in that. Why, there's nothing to do with language and language processing, and that, that, that's on the Watson side. Let's take a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, is there anybody at IBM who addresses questions that are a little bit more philosophical, like what is creativity or what is understanding? What does that really mean? And can we get uh, computers to kind of go in that direction to be more 
like humans or? Um, is there a game show that tests that? I, I, um, <laughs> so David, you and I would have been is, are they doing, uh, you talk about, which one are you talking about? Oh, okay. So the, the, the stuff looking at the, br the brain and, yeah. Mapping of the brain. Yeah, mapping of the brain. So yeah, that's where, where that, that work is going on at all. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm generally interested in that. I mean, I, I, I was doing, comp, you know, this, this, I had this thing about computational creativity because I did story generation and uh, for a while. Um, where we did, um, I remember that, we were doing t uh, story generation and I was working with a guy at RPI, and he said, you know, this is so hard because we can never come up with interesting stories. And, um, and I said, well, yeah, I, I mean, you, you gotta come up with interesting story stories by cheating. And he goes, what do you mean by cheating? But this goes back to the point about, about meaning and where meaning really comes from. Because, you know, we could, you know, we could vary plot elements and we, you know, we can you know, vary style and language, but we can't come up with something interesting. So you gotta cheat. You gotta go to Shakespeare. He covered all interesting human themes. Okay, they're basically all done, and there's only a few of them, frankly. And um, and you have to start with what you know is interesting to humans. You're not gonna come up with interesting to humans. You're a computer, so you know you've got to basically start with what you know is interesting. And so for portrayals, a classic, you know, you know, human theme, you know, Julius Caesar, of course. But you know, it's like, you know, so classic human theme. So start with sort of a representation of portrayal that you know, is universal across plots and, and across style, and then build a plot around the theme and then build language and style you know, around, around the plot. And I built a story generator called Brutus after you know, Julius Caesar. Um, so that was the idea behind there. But then you know, the idea was can we, general, can we generalize that around you know, a model for you know, you, you know, creativity? Um, but anyway, um, so I, I don't know, but I sympathize with the interest. Last question. What's kind of the weakest link in the way Watson's implemented right now? Is it the size of the knowledge base? Is it the way you're uh, updating the weight of evidence for the different algorithms? Or is it the number of algorithms themselves? Yeah, I think, I, so the weakest thing is the fact that it takes a lot of work to adapt. So in other words, you know, when you go from um, one domain to another, take going to medicine, for example. So when you look at the Jeopardy domain, and this is just, uh, it gives you a flavor of where things can change dramatically, right? So. So in, uh, in, uh, in Jeopardy, you're not going to read something like um, uh, George Washington was not the 16th president of the United States. You're not going to read that, right? But your preponderance of information is going to be positive statements, not negative statements for, for that kind of stuff. You go to medicine, they always talk about what's not happening. <laughs> so, you know, this is non-binding, and you know, and this is, you know, under these conditions, this is never a cause of, or this is unlikely a cause of this. And so, there's lots of there's lots of information expressed in the form of negation. Negation can be notoriously difficult to 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 detect because it's not like you know they formally write in a perfect negation, right? Um, so. Um, so these, these are linguistic challenges that vary from domain to domain, style to style, and you have to have to adapt all those algorithms. Um, so, you know, a patient doesn't have temperature. What do you mean the patient doesn't have temperature? Of course the patient has temperature. <laughs> so, um, was the patient alive? Even the patient's not alive, they have temperature. Um, so, you know, what do you really mean? You know, what do you really mean by that? So, you know, you, each domain, there's a lot of subtlety with how language is used in that domain. So these algorithms really need to be adapted. And this goes back to where, when I said, you know, people under, you know, some people under and overestimate Watson. I think this gets into the overestimation. I mean, we're not interpreting language and humans are so good because they have that mental map, because they have that cognitive understanding. You can make all kinds of mistakes with the words and everything else, but you know, you're familiar with that domain. You have this rich cognitive representation, this mental representation of what's going on, and you could map those words on there. I mean, one of the things I noticed with, with, with you know, one of the things I noticed with my kids, young kids, is that I can you, know, I can use these really complex grammatical constructions with all kinds of nested parentheticals, like the one I just did now, and just keep going with them. And, um, and they're like, mm, you know, and they just, and you know, they ignore most of it and they focus on the, the key things. And then they say, oh, daddy, if by intricate you meant hard, then yeah, I can't do my homework. Uh, you know, and you know, so, so because, because what's happening is you're, you're, you're mapping into their space, and, you know, they, the things that map, map, and, and then they're reinterpreting, they're, they're, they're mapping back into language the understanding they already had with maybe a little tweak. You know, she's not doing that, right? It's, 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 it's an extreme disadvantage. 
So, so anyways, that's what ends up being hard is what it takes to really adapt to that language because it doesn't have the same understanding that the human has. And that could be a lot of work. So I want to thank David.